Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is a screencast-o-matic presentation and recording for the part of the lesson that has us looking at religion in the United States specifically. Before we get started, please let me encourage you to open up to the correct lesson and then scroll down to the correct section and please get ready to answer the key concept questions that happen to appear on the doc and then remember to uh, please move on accordingly. So for this part of the lesson, we're going to be mastering these objectives. By the end of this particular section, you'll be able to give examples of religion as an agent of social change and then describe the current US trends, including megachurches and secularization. So let's go ahead and get started to understand a little bit more about the role that religion plays in our society. In examining the state of religion in the United States today, we see the complexity of religious life in our society, plus emerging trends like the rise of the megachurch, secularization, and the role of religion in social change. Religion and social change. Religion has historically seen an impetus to social change. The transition of sacred texts into everyday, non-scholarly language empowered people to shape their religions. Disagreements between religious groups and instances of religious persecution have led to wars and genocides. The United States is no stranger to religion as an agent of social change. In fact, the United States' first European arrivals were acting largely on religious convictions when they were compelled to settle in the United States. Liberation Theology so liberation theology began as a movement within the Roman Catholic Church in the 1950s and 1960s in Latin America, and it combines Christian principles with political activism. It uses the church to promote social change via the political arena, and it is most often seen in the attempts to reduce or eliminate social injustice, discrimination, and poverty. A list of proponents of this kind of social justice, although some predate liberation theory, could include Francis Alassisi, Leo Torosti, Martin Luther King Jr., and Desmond Tutu. Although begun as a moral reaction against, the, against poverty caused by social injustice in that part of the world, today liberation theology is an international movement that encompasses many churches and denominations. Liberation theologians discuss theology from the point of view of the poor and the oppressed, and some interpret the scriptures as a call to action against poverty and injustice. So in Europe and North America, feminist theology has emerged from liberation theology as a movement to bring social justice to women. Let's go ahead and look at the next section right here, religious leaders and the rainbow of gay pride. So what happens when a religious leader officiates a gay marriage against denomination policies? What about when the same minister defends the action in part by coming out and making her own lesbian relationship known to the church? In the case of Reverend Amy DeLong, it meant a church trial. Some leaders in her denomination assert that homosexuality is incompatible with her faith, while others feel the type of discrimination has no place in a modern church. As the LBGT community increasingly advocates for and earns basic civil rights, how will religious communities respond? Many religious groups have traditionally discounted LGBT sexualities as wrong. However, these organizations have moved closer to respecting human rights by, for example, increasingly recognizing females as an equal gender, and the Roman Catholic Church drew controversial attention to this issue in 2010 when the Vatican Secretary of the State suggested homosexuality was in part to blame for pedophilic sexual abuse scandals that have plagued the church. Because numerous studies have shown that there is to be no relationship between homosexuality and pedophilia, nor a higher incidence of pedophilia among homosexuals than among heterosexuals, the Vatican's comments seem suspect. More recently, Pope Francis has been pushing for a more open church, and some Catholic bishops have been advocating for a more gay-friendly church. This has not come to pass, but some scholars believe that these changes are a matter of time. No matter the situation, most religions have a tenuous at best relationship with practitioners and leaders in the gay community. As one of the earliest Christian denominations to break barriers by ordaining women to serve as pastors, will Amy DeLong's United Methodist denomination also be a leader in the LGBT rights within Christian church-going society? Next up is megachurches. So a megachurch is a Christian church that has a very large congregation averaging more than 2,000 people who attend regular weekly services. As of 2009, the largest megachurch in the United States was in Houston, Texas, boasting an average weekly attendance of more than 43,000. Megachurches exist in other parts of the world, especially in South Korea, Brazil, and several African countries. But the rise of the megachurch in the United States is a fairly recent phenomenon that has developed primarily in California, Florida, Georgia, and Texas. Since 1970, the number of megachurches in this country has grown from about 50 to more than 1,000, which of course is very substantial most of which are attached to the Southern Baptist denomination. Approximately 6 million people are members of these churches, and the architecture of these church buildings often resembles a sport or concert arena. 
The church may include uh, jumbo orsons, which is a large screen t a television, uh, televisual technology used in sports arenas to show close-up shots of the event. And worship services feature contemporary music with drums and electric guitars and use state-of-the-art sound equipment. The buildings sometimes include food courts, sports and recreation facilities, and bookstores. Services such as child care and mental health counseling are often offered too. Typically, a single highly charismatic pastor leads the megachurch. At present, all are male. Some megachurches and their preachers have a huge television presence, and viewers all around the country watch and respond to their shows and fundraising. Besides size, U.S. megachurches share other traits, including conservative theology, evangelism, and of course the use of technology and social networking. Facebook, Twitter, podcasts, blogs, hugely charismatic leaders, few financial struggles, multiple sites, and predominantly white membership. But they list their main focus as youth activities, community service, and the study of the scripture. Critics of megachurches believe that they are too large to promote close relationships among fellow church members or the pastor, as could occur in smaller houses of worship, and supporters note that in addition to the large worship services, congregations generally meet in small groups, and some megachurches have informal events throughout the week to allow the community building. In terms of secularization here, historical sociologists like Emil Durkheim, Max Weber, and Karl Marx, and psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud anticipated secularization and claimed that the modernization of society would bring about a decrease in the influence of religion. Weber believed membership in distinguished clubs would outpace membership in Protestant sects as a way to people to gain authority or respect. Conversely, some people suggest secularization is a root of the cause of many social problems, such as divorce, drug use, and educational downturn. One time, presidential contender Michelle Bachman even linked Hurricane Irene and the 2011 earthquake felt in Washington, D.C. to politicians' failure to listen to God. While some scholars see the United States becoming increasingly secular, others observe a rise in fundamentalism. Compared to other democratic industrialized societies and countries, the United States is generally perceived to be a fairly religious nation. Whereas 65% of the U.S. adults in 2009 Gallup survey said religion was an important part of their daily lives, the numbers were lower in Spain with 49%, Canada and 42%, France at 30%, and the United Kingdom at 27%, Sweden at 7 So in many ways, these are startling statistics. But secularization interests uh, social observers because it entails a pattern of change in a fundamental social institution. This is an interesting section right here that's part of your reading and questions as well. Thank God for that touchdown, separation of church and state. Imagine three public universities with football games scheduled on Saturday. At University A, a group of students in the stands who share the same faith decide to form a circle amid the spectators to pray for the team. For 15 minutes, people in the circle share their prayers aloud among the group. At University B, the team ahead of halftime decides to join together in prayer, giving thanks and seeking support from God. This lasts for the first 10 minutes of halftime on the sidelines of the field while spectators watch. At University C, the game program includes, among its opening moments, two minutes set aside for a team captain to share a prayer of his choosing with the spectators. In the tricky area of separation of church and state, which of these actions is allowed and which is forbidden? In our three fictional scenarios, the last example is against the law, while the first two situations are perfectly acceptable. In the United States, a nation founded on the principles of religious freedom, many settlers were escaping religious persecution in Europe, how, stringently, do we adhere to this ideal? How well do we strike people's right to practice any belief system of their choosing? The answer just might be, depending on what religion you practice. In 2003, for example, a lawsuit escalated in Alabama regarding a monument to the Ten Commandments in a public building. In response, a poll was conducted by USA Today, CNN, and Gallup, and among the findings, 70% of people approved of a Christian Ten Commandments monument in public, while only 33% approved of a monument to the Islamic Quran in the same space. Similarly, survey respondents showed a 64% approval of social programs run by Christian organizations, but only 41% approved of the same programs run by Muslim groups. So these statistics suggest that for most people in the United States, freedom of religion is less important than religion under discussion. And this is precisely the point made by those who argue for separation of church and state. According to their contention, any state-sanctioned recognition of religion suggests endorsement of one belief system at the expense of others, contradictory to the area of freedom of religion. So, what violates separation of church and state, and what is acceptable? Myriad lawsuits continue to test the answer. In the case of the three fictional examples above, the issue of spontaneity is key, as is the existence or lack thereof of planning on the part of event organizers. The next time you're at a state event, political, public, school, community, and the topic of religion comes up, consider where it falls in this debate.
So in summary here, guys, liberation theology combines Christian principles with political activism to address social injustice, discrimination, and poverty. Mega churches are those with a membership of more than 2,000 regular attendees, and they are vibrant, growing, and highly influential segment of the U.S. religious life. And some sociologists believe levels of religiosity in the United States are declining, called secularization, while others observe a rise in fundamentalism. Only time will tell the role of religion in the United States of America. For the time being, think about your perception of religion as a construct, as it affects our lives on a daily basis, probably in more ways than one. Thank you very much for tuning in, and good luck with completing the rest of the lesson.